spiritual head of the people in the Emirates. So, of course, we could talk about centralization of power in the Alsa slash Fulani pre colonial system of administration. In the Igbo pre colonial system of administration, the case was different. The powers, political powers, were shared among or four title holders or some title holders. And let me quickly add that the also title is a title given to very prominent wealthy members of the Igbo society. So, of course, they wield their political powers too by virtue of their wealth. So, power, like I was going to say, was not centralized. Power was distributed among every member. So, they would say that the Igbos knew no king because no one single person was seen as, 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 as someone and a leader that everyone could follow. Decisions were made, everyone set their mind, and decisions were taken back to the family. And, of course, consensus were reached using persuasion. In the Yoruba system of uh, pre colonial administration, we discussed that power that all the members, the Ogboni group, the Allah, friend, the Council of Oyomesi, and what have you, all had a mechanism for checking the other. The Allah friend was checked by the Council of Oyomesi, the Council of Oyomesi was equally checked by the Ogboni members. And of course, the, 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 the army organization, if they fail in their duty, the leader has to commit suicide. So the principle of checks and balance was actually properly implemented in the Yoruba pre-colonial system of administration. We are done with pre-colonial system of administration. We shall now move into the colonial administration. After the pre-colonial, we talk about the colonial administration. What are we to say about colonial administration? First, it is an administration that was established because of the scramble for the partitioning of West Africa by European nations. Of course, European nations had to scramble for West Africa because of the quest for raw materials and of course the quest for markets for finished products. The quest for both raw material and of course the market for finished product led to European nations coming to Africa and that led to the scramble and of course the eventual distribution of African nations like cakes to the European nations. That was what led to colonial administration in Africa. Now we shall briefly talk about features of this colonial administration. First, central administration. Second, native administration. Let us talk about the central administration. The central administration was headed by the governor and the governor was appointed by the Secretary of State. The, then the governor administered the whole country, presided over by both the Legislative and Executive Council. What I mean is that the governor who was appointed by the Secretary presided over both the Legislative and the Executive Council. In the case of Central Administration in the Colonial Administration. The next is the Native Administration. This is, of course, another name for indirect rule. The native administration in this system, in this administration, traditional political institution, we are used to govern the people. Traditional political institution were never dismantled in the native administration. They were allowed to stay, and using this mechanism, the people will be ruled in what is called indirect rule system. Now, what are the impacts of colonial administration? We shall now discuss impacts of colonial administration. We shall consider about four of them. First, the colonial administration brought about modern ideas of government. That Nigeria as a country today claims to be practicing democracy as a system of government is an idea that was built or bought after a colonial administration. So some modern ideas of government were bought during the colonial administration and imported into countries today. The next is exposure to Western education. Yes, colonial administration exposed Nigerians and, of course, indeed Africans to, to, to Western education. People saw the need to study. People saw that they needed to, to acquire education so that they could occupy some of the lofty political positions occupied by the whites when they were at the helm of affairs. The next is exploitation. That's another impact of colonial administration. Africa was adequately and sufficiently exploited by these uh, white uh, masters. And of course, that has led to what some people today insist has been a problem of, of, of the African nation. Because during the colonial administration, a lot of healthy, vivacious 
young men and women we are exporting to Europe to develop places like America. And of course, the dredges of the society, if you like, or the weak ones, we are left in Africa. And of course, that is why Africa, some would insist, has remained on the ground and has not worked for several centuries. The next impact is cultural imperialism. Of course, when a country or a continent is colonized, the colonizers bring their way of life, their tradition, their culture, and impose these on, 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 on their colony. That's what has happened on that colonial uh, cultural imperialism. So our way of life these days, uh, totality of experiences, uh, one way or the other, reflects uh, the fact that we were once under the administration of uh, white slave masters. Now, we shall be talking about British and French colonial policies. Virtually all African nations fell under the colonial administration of either Britain, United States of America, Germany, Portugal, except of course Liberia. Other Afri West African nations fell under the, uh, the colonial administration of the countries I mentioned. But we shall now focus on the British and uh, French colonial policies. We shall compare. The British um, colonial policy uh, actually made use of what they refer to as indirect rule system. In this system, traditional rulers we are, we are, we are used to rule the, the, the masses, the people. Of course, in the case of Nigeria, they were not dismantled. But in the French colonial system, we discovered that they first of all started with the principle or policy of assimilation, which was later amended to the principle or policy of association. In this system, the France rather ruled its colony as if they were an extension of their country in what is known as the uh, Frenchifying the Africans. They wanted these people to imbibe their culture and way of life, hook, line, and sinker. But Britain ruled their colony with the thought that a day would come when those people would gain independence and be on their own. But the reverse was the, case, was, was the case in the case of France, because their hope was that it is an extension and that there may never be a time when the people under that colony would be free. So they ruled it as if it was an extension. That was why they gave them a whole lot of opportunities. And that was why there was a lot of developments in the French colonies, as opposed to the British colonies, because they knew a time would come when they would leave. But the French never envisaged the time would come when the people under their colony would become free. So these are the main issues in the comparison of both British and the French colonial policy. Remember I said in Britain, Britain brought about a system of indirect rule. So the British colonial policy was that of indirect rule system, ruling the people using their own people, that's indirect system. But in the French colony what we have was the principle of assimilation. People, nations and countries, or rather countries, or colonies rather, I would say, colonies under the French system of government. We are ruled as an extension of France, countries like Senegal and what have you. So looking at the comparison, we would see that Britain was actually submerged in the system of indirect rule, while France was submerged in the system of assimilation and of course later association. Now we are done with the comparisons. We shall now focus on nationalism. What is nationalism? The definition of nationalism actually would depend on the person defining it because it could be seen from different perspectives. But we shall restrict ourselves to the definition of KBC Own Biko, who defines nationalism as a patriotic sentiment or activities on the part of groups of Africans held together by the bond of common language and historical experience to assert their right to live under government of their own, making for preservation of their political, economic, and social interests. A number of issues stand out in this definition. A group of persons who have decided to own their government, to take their decision, to have a say in a decision that affects their life. That is what nationalism is all about. And of course, 